In today's Farm Report, producers have management plans for various aspects of their operation, whether it be for budget, planting, or employees. But, as Rod Bain with the U.S. Department of Agriculture explains, it's also good to have a management plan for nutrients. How important is it for ag producers to have a nutrient management plan in place? The University of Maryland Extension's Trish Steinhibler. To see it as kind of dotting your I's and crossing your T's as a nutrient user in an agricultural setting in the United States. So what exactly is the purpose of a nutrient management plan? A nutrient management plan is a standard operating procedure guidance document for how one is going to use nutrients on their farm and why those decisions were made the way they were because of what they're growing, what they have grown, what their soils already contain, and any nutrient sources they're going to use. And Steinhibler says farmers play a key role in developing such a plan as they will be gathering much of the needed information. Whether they develop that plan on their own or in conjunction with a technical expert like a USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service field official or nutrient management consultant. For example, many farmers operate or farm more than one tract of land or more than one property. They would certainly have to supply information and map and information about each of those properties, location, size, watershed. They'd have to have the fields delineated so that the person who would be ultimately doing the plan would understand the layout. They'd have to have information about crop rotation. They'd have to have soil tests and manure analysis. If there's animals being produced, the planner's going to need to know what kind of animals and how big they are and whether or not they're pastured, part or all of the time. And all of that stuff is something that only the farmer knows. Many farmers may already have nutrient management plans in place and not even know it, as USDA NRCS has what is known as 590 nutrient management standards in place for its programs. Dein Hibbler says while there are variations in 590 standards from farm to farm, from state to state, those requirements are similar. Every plan is going to require information about properties, information about animal production, soil tests, manure tests, and rational recommendations, usually based on the land grant university's nutrient recommendations for crops. And as for state requirements for nutrient management plans themselves, Stein Hibbler says that also varies. Obviously, any operation that's considered a confined animal feeding operation is required to have a comprehensive nutrient management plan, which is even more involved than what we have to do in Maryland. There are other states that require certain kinds of operations to have nutrient management plans, poultry in Virginia, for example. There are locations in the upper Great Lakes where if you want a building permit or you want to expand, you need a nutrient management plan. So it really varies across the landscape. And software is available in many states through land-grant universities and other sources to help producers develop nutrient management plans. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. We do have wind chill advisories over 70 percent of the United States. You can't turn on the TV or radio news without hearing about the dangerously cold weather moving into places that rarely see such low temperatures and wind chills, into places where livestock producers may not have had to manage such weather before. Jeff Limkuller is University of Kentucky Extension Livestock Specialist. He told us... Livestock producers during these periods of extreme cold temperatures need to ensure that their beef cattle or livestock that are outside have access to some sort of windbreak, whether that's natural or man-made, to get them out of the wind. They need to ensure that their waters are not frozen, the livestock have access to plenty of water, and they need to adjust their daily feed supplement to increase the caloric intake. Ensure that the cattle or livestock stay dry to prevent any type of hypothermia and or frostbite. The younger the animal, the more susceptible it is to the cold. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Technology has allowed many businesses to expand, especially a lot of small businesses who may be able to move into more markets where larger companies have traditionally held the ground. Rod Bain with the U.S. Department of Agriculture has more. There is big business and there is small business. But thanks to modern technology, could there be a paradigm shift, so to speak? One where small is the new big? North Carolina State University economics professor Mike Walden believes one can argue for such a case, with technology playing a key role. The advent of modern technology allowing virtually anyone at a fairly inexpensive cost to access data for market analysis, to utilize fairly sophisticated programs to manage their business, to extend their business, to communicate with suppliers, to identify buyers. All that has come about in the last, really, 20 years, and it virtually allows someone to run a business and really run a business across state lines or even across country lines from their home if they choose to do that. 
And what this has allowed small business owners to do is reduce the cost of both their overhead and the sophisticated tools they need to operate their business, tools that were once only available and affordable to larger scale companies. There is also the factor of flexibility. We are in a fast-paced economy. There are more competitors. There are certainly more consumers, but consumers, because there are more competitors, seem to be more fickle. People's attitudes, tastes, and preferences can change on a dime. Sometimes I think this makes it harder for a big business to change because they have so much bureaucracy. They have so many, perhaps, entrenched ways of doing things. And I think, in a way, this can shift the advantage to the small business who doesn't have those things and can perhaps move at almost a lightning pace. As far as examples of this potential paradigm shift, Walden says one can look at the growth of the microbrew and craft beer industry over the last 20 years. The vast majority of beer sold today in the U.S., I think it's over 90%, is still sold by two companies. But two decades ago, it was 95%. And what has happened is, I think, a perfect illustration of where small may be better. People are now desirous of individual products, specialized products, different products, and this has really spawned the development of microbrewery. Now, Walden is convinced that there will still be big and small business when it's all said and done, and eventually things equal out. Case in point, the telecommunications industry. We did have the big breakup, if you will, of Mobile a couple of decades ago that resulted in a larger number of telecommunications writing companies. Then we had the advent of the cell phone, we had the advent of the internet and packaging and so forth. And that looks like we're going through some consolidation. So the market there is trying to reach some new equilibrium. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Dwayne DeLuz and his family raise low-stress grass-fed cattle on the big island of Hawaii. They got help from USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service to ensure there was enough healthy grass to feed their cows. One step was fencing off sections of pasture for rotational grazing. Eating all that grass, though, made the cows thirsty. Our regular uh, mud pond that was, was built uh, in the beginning of when we started the ranch basically went dry several times over the past six years. Once we put this uh, new line pond in, uh, we have not had a problem with water, have not had to purchase uh, water from the county, and uh, we've been self-sufficient. NRCS also helped install water troughs throughout the pasture. Andrew Stout is an NRCS engineer. We used a pond liner and sealed that. We added some water harvesting catchment. We used that to catch rainwater and store it in the pond. So we had to help get water everywhere he needed to. Since then, the cattle have had plenty of diverse healthy grass supported by strong protected soils. For USDA Radio, Susan Carter, Washington, D.C. The issue of smell from livestock or feedlot operations can be an issue, and many jurisdictions have rules to help limit the exposure. But, as Rod Bain with the U.S. Department of Agriculture explains, nature may have a solution. Wine lovers know what tannins are. Tannins give flavors to wines, for example, from grape leaves or grape skin. And USDA researcher Terry Whitehead knows what tannins are as well. He and colleagues at the Agricultural Research Service in Peoria, Illinois, have been using this substance, found in the bark and leaves of trees and plants, to study a natural method to reduce the odor of livestock manure. The odors and emissions from the swine facilities and other large-scale facilities can be a problem if they drift down towards where people live, and this can be a kind of a hassle between the local populace. Now, in the Midwest, swine producers have underground pits where manure collects under the barns, collected and applied as fertilizer on crop ground. The problem is during the storage periods between they can apply in spring and fall, as material build up, the bacteria present in the manure start degrading the manure. They are just basically doing what they do. And the net result of that is production of different compounds that go off into the atmosphere. And that's what we perceive as swine manure odor, which is somewhat unique compared to other manures, such as dairy cattle and things like that. Once I've ever been by a swine facility, it's quite a pungent aroma. So Whitehead and fellow researchers studied how tannins from various plant materials would work to combat bacteria-producing odor in manure. What worked best were tannins from the quebraco tree. Actually, we tested a number of different tannins from chestnuts and other sources that are by the tannin industry. And it turns out that Quebecco happened to work best at the lowest concentrations compared to others. Actually, some of them work not nearly as well. Some actually enhance production of gases. When we're doing initially is measuring gas production, things like hydrogen sulfide, CO2 hydrogen, when we do our test in the lab. And so as it turned out, the Quebecco actually worked best at the lowest concentrations. So that's why we decided to concentrate on that one. 
Currently, quabraco is used as a powdered form. The Whitehead says it could potentially become part of a water solution applied to the manure pits as well. Over time, depending on how things fall out, you could add it periodically or could add enough in there in the beginning to do the effect. That's something we need to test. Actually, we're working towards trying to work with some producers to test it on site, hopefully in the near future. Field testing still needs to be conducted to determine reductions of greenhouse gases compared to in the laboratory. And Whitehead believes natural products like quabraco tannins have a commercial application as well as environmental benefits. It's an ongoing project, and we hope to have a product that will help out the swine producer and the people living around swine facilities in the near future. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. The United Nations General Assembly has declared 2015 the International Year of Soils, a campaign to recognize the importance of soil health in our daily lives. USDA is participating through agencies like the Natural Resources Conservation Service, but NRCS Chief Jason Weller says soil health has always been a part of USDA's history. This is something from the creation of our department at USDA we've been focused on since 1862. Before there was an NRCS, there was a Soil Conservation Service. Before there was an SCS, there was a Soil Erosion Service. Before the Soil Erosion Service, it's the Bureau of the Soils. People have been talking about this for a long time. And while many associate USDA's emphasis on soil health going back to the then Soil Conservation Service in the Dust Bowl era, the chief says the department has supported soil health well before that. This is something we've been engaged with through extension, through our collaboration with universities, through our own research capabilities, through not just through the Soil Conservation and the NRCS Conservation Services, but also with the U.S. Forest Service. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C.